Near the ancient Roman frontier in the rolling hills of northern England is the remains of a unique Roman fort and a former town outside its walls. While there are many ruined forts around the area of Hadrian's Wall, this location in particular contains some of the most well-preserved Roman artifacts found anywhere in the world, including some unique pieces never before discovered. But the site is most famous for its hundreds of preserved wooden writing tablets from Roman times, with texts that can still be deciphered. This is James from History Victorum. Join us as we explore the Roman fort of Vindolanda. The fort of Vindolanda is located in northern England, about one mile south of Hadrian's Wall. The word Vindolanda comes from the combination of the Celtic Vindos meaning white or shining and Landa meaning either field or enclosure. We aren't sure why it is known by this name. One theory I like is the name of white field could be due to the frost, which remains on the ground after sunrise in winter, while Vindolanda is still shaded from the hills to the east. Today, we can still see remains of the 3rd century fort walls, which still stand up to 6 feet high, along with the remains of its major buildings. On the outside of the fort was a former town, built around 213 AD under Emperor Caracalla. Here we have remains of houses, stores, and workshops. We can see along the road part of a water system. Small aqueducts carried water from springs on the plateau, which flowed into drains here on the side of the street. On the site are also reconstructions of parts of Hadrian's Wall and the Vindolanda Museum. Throughout its history, Vindolanda is believed to have had nine different forts on the site, which were demolished and rebuilt on top of each other. It was these layers that helped preserve its ancient artifacts. Typically, ancient remains of items made from leather, wood, or other material would degrade over time. But when the early forts were demolished and rebuilt at Vindolanda, the ground was leveled with a layer of clay and earth, preparing for the new fort to be built. The items buried under this layer were preserved in a unique environment that was devoid of oxygen and water, which allowed unusual items from the Roman Empire to survive to this day. For example, this helmet crest made of a plant called hair moss is the only Roman helmet crest ever found. These are the oldest boxing gloves ever found, the next oldest being over a thousand years later, and we even have the most well-preserved wooden toilet seat in the Roman Empire. Over 7,000 shoes were found of various types, the largest collection of Roman footwear ever discovered. The Roman soldiers had several different types of shoes, studded boots for walking outside, other shoes for inside, and wooden clogs for baths, as the bathhouse floors would have been very hot. There are also more finely decorated shoes as well. I was particularly excited to see its bronze objects. These are remnants of bronze scale armor. Typically when you see bronze objects from this time, they have transformed into this dark or greenish color. But due to the conditions at Vindolanda, this piece of bronze armor still shines as it did during the time of the Roman Empire. We can see a replica of scale armor here. In the Roman army, scale and chain armor were typically worn by auxiliaries or troops that were not Roman citizens, whereas this type of iron sheet armor was worn by legionaries until later centuries when it fell into disuse. The stone fort and town that we see today are mostly from the early 3rd to 4th centuries. Here we can see the remains of a tower from its western gate which led outside to the town. We're not sure exactly how the towers originally looked. They may have looked like this reconstruction of Hadrian's Wall, or they may have had a small roof. Much of the most well-preserved and exciting finds, including its famous writing tablets, come from the earlier forts at Vindolanda. The original forts at Vindolanda were made from wood in the late 1st century and early 2nd century AD. These forts were built with different layouts, and here was the location of the southern entrance of one of these wooden forts. Nearby is a reconstruction using Roman building techniques of a part of Hadrian's Wall. Although this is part of Hadrian's Wall and not actually the fort of Vindolanda, it still gives us some idea of what it would have felt like to walk through the original wooden forts. This finely decorated imported pottery was discovered from the first timber fort. Here we can make out a scene from a gladiatorial arena with a man fighting a lion, a depiction of a winged victory, and scenes of hunting dogs. 
The names of the potters which were inscribed on the pots are the same names found in an unopened crate in the city of Pompeii, which was buried in ash in 79 AD. This particular style of pottery was not seen until about 85. So this Roman fort is believed to date from that time, around 85 AD, which was before the building of Hadrian's Wall, which started around 122 AD. It was from these early wooden forts where Vendalanda's most famous finds would be discovered. Hundreds of fragments of wooden writing tablets were found preserved with letters that could still be deciphered. These were written on thin strips of wood, which is much cheaper than importing something like papyrus. When complete, the wooden tablets would have been about 8 inches by 3.5 inches, and they had grooves so that they could be folded in the center, and holes were on the sides so that they could be sealed or tied together. Some rare examples of wooden pens were found, which were made from wood with metal tips. Some had a hole in the middle for ink, just like a modern fountain pen. These wooden tablets contain unique insights into daily life on the Roman frontier, including a listing of a man who would be taken out of the province in chains, invitations to a birthday party, requests for soldiers for more beer, and many requests for leave of duty. One report describes the native tribes, who the Romans generalized to the Britons. It mentions the Britons as unprotected by armor and having very many cavalry. It mentions the word Britunculi, which means something like wretched or nasty little Brits, although this is the only time the term is used. Another report mentions the Britons bringing wagons of corn to trade with the garrisons. While much of Roman history that we have today revolves around emperors and generals, at Vindolanda we have named individuals with average jobs. Tablets listing goods to be distributed mention individuals such as Luco who was in charge of the pigs, Primus, a slave of Lucius, Victor the huntsman, and Atrectus the brewer. The first timber fort that was built around 85 was abandoned about five years later, possibly related to a revolt against Emperor Domitian in 89. Vindolanda was rebuilt soon afterward, around 92 AD. The majority of the writing tablets come from the third timber fort, believed to have existed from about 100 to 105 AD. We have much correspondence from the commander of the fort, Flavius Cerealis, and his family, including the invitation to a birthday party we mentioned earlier. Typically, the letters were written by a scribe, with the sender sometimes writing a personal greeting at the end. The tablets with greetings to the wife of Cerealis, Lepidina, are some of the oldest surviving Latin texts we have anywhere that were written by a woman. Evidence of children at Vindolanda was also found. This toy sword was found as well as this writing exercise, which has a quotation from Virgil's Aeneid and the attempt by the student to try to copy the words. There are many other writing tablets listing guests and items for dinner parties, as well as hunting supplies, including snares to catch ducks and swans, and nets for fishing. Interestingly, there's little mention of military matters, and we might give the impression that Cerealis may have been more of an aristocrat and a figurehead rather than a military leader. One of my favorite tablets is from a unit which was sent elsewhere and asked for orders and asked for more beer to be sent. But what is remarkable about this one is that it mentions Cerealis as my king. Vindolanda, like most forts across Britain, is an auxiliary fort, meaning that they were not Roman citizens. From about 100 to 105, it was manned by the Germanic Batavians which were known for their aquatic abilities and were said to have been able to swim across rivers in full armor. It seems that Cerealis was a king of the Batavians and was given command of some of his people in the Roman fort. This fort would be abandoned fairly suddenly around 105 AD. It's likely that the troops were needed to support Emperor Trajan in his war against Dacia, which is immortalized here on Trajan's column in Rome. Much of the items in the fort were burned in a large bonfire near this later stone fort wall, but the items did not burn completely, possibly due to the weather in the area. Much of the preserved artifacts and tablets we have today come from the remnants of this bonfire, along with others that were lost in carpets, which were made from a plant material called bracken. This brooch found at Vindolanda has the inscription of Q. Solonius. It has an image of Mars, the god of war, and shields similar to the Dacian shield on Trajan's column in Rome. 
it's possible that this brooch was given to Salonius for outstanding service in the Dacian Wars. The fort at Vindolanda was rebuilt and reoccupied soon afterward, but with the death of Emperor Trajan, the times of peace and stability at Vindolanda were just about to end. Around 117 AD, when Hadrian had succeeded as emperor, a rebellion of some sort had broken out in Britain. An unusually large number of bolts from ballistas were found at Vindolanda from this time, much more than any other time period. Also found during this time was the skull of an ox, which seemed to have been used for target practice, and is pierced with several javelin holes. Also, one of my favorite artifacts, this thumb guard that was once used by an archer. We don't have much surviving records from this time, but part of a tombstone was discovered, listing the death of Titus Aeneas, who had died in the war, who was a centurion at Vindolanda. Centurions were the head of centuries, which consisted of about 80 men. Here in the fort barracks, ordinary soldiers would stay in groups of eight in each of these rooms, but the centurion had large rooms at the end of the barracks like this one. This uprising likely helped contribute to Hadrian's decision to build a great wall across Britain later in 122 AD. When Hadrian was building the wall, evidence of iron production at Vindolanda was found using the nearby mines. The fort was built very close to deposits of minerals, including lead, iron, clay, and coal, all of which were in operation by the soldiers. Hadrian may have visited Vindolanda himself, a letter was found which seemingly was directed toward the emperor, mentioning your majesty, and was appealing punishment that was imposed on this person. A large elaborate building was found here, which has been suggested that it may have been built for Hadrian. This elaborate pen was found on the site, with a bronze lion on top. We're not sure when Vindolanda was first built in stone, but is believed to have been somewhere between 130 AD and 160 possibly during the time of the building of the Antonine Wall, which extended deeper into Scotland. Construction of the Antonine Wall started around 143 AD, but was permanently abandoned around 162. It's possible that there was always some sort of wooden town outside the fort, but the stone town ruins that are visible today date from about 213 AD under Roman Emperor Caracalla. The site is still being excavated, and Vindolanda at its peak is believed to have housed four to 5,000 people. The houses often had storefronts facing the street, with living accommodation on the back or possibly upper floors. They were charged taxes by how much of the house bordered the street, so they tended to have very long houses to avoid this. There were several springs on the hillside and water flowed down through small aqueducts. There's also remnants of a military bathhouse, which is typically outside the fort, and there's some evidence of civilians also using this bathhouse. Here we can see remnants of a butcher shop, where a butcher knife was found and remains of animals were discovered. It has an L-shaped counter and drains on the floor for fluids. This building near the entrance of the fort is known as the tavern. A large amount of glassware was found here including what is known as the gladiator glass, which showed scenes of gladiators in combat. The front of the building had an open area for guests and a small kitchen. A hoard of over 270 coins was found buried underneath the kitchen, possibly when there were signs of trouble, but they were never retrieved by the owner. Near the edge of town is the remains of a large building built by the father of Emperor Caracalla, Emperor Septimius Severus. Septimius Severus had traveled to Britain on campaign against the northern tribes, with his empress Julia Domna and his sons Caracalla and Greta, and a new stone fort was constructed at Vindolanda. Although it was built only a few years earlier than the fort we see today, it had a much different layout than the current stone fort. This commander's residence we see here would have been inside the fort, but is now near the edge of the later town. It was discovered under some of the town buildings. This impressive building was built somewhere around 210. It consisted of six bedrooms, a kitchen, a private toilet, a heated dining room, and private baths. Found inside the building was a betrothal medallion made from jet and the largest gold ring found at Vindolanda with an image of Medusa. This skull was found from this time, possibly from one of the rebelling tribes to the north. It is believed to have been posted on a pole as a trophy. 
Inside this fort were mysterious circular stone houses, which were normal for Britons in the area, but have never been seen inside any other Roman fort. They would have looked something like these with thatch roofs on top. They were possibly used as refugee camps for Britons who were loyal to Rome at the time, or possibly for prisoners taken during the war, but we aren't really sure. Also found in one of the fort buildings from this time was this bronze horse. This is one of the more famous finds of Vendolanda and is something of a logo for the site. It is thought to be either a decorative element on a wagon or part of a cavalry standard. Standards were carried into battle by the standard bearer. We can see an example of standards here on the Arch of Constantine in Rome. Standards are sometimes decorated with bronze discs and some sort of decorative element on top. The standard bearer who would hold this standard also helped handle the finances of the fort and served as something of a banker. He would pay wages in the main headquarters building of the fort called the Principia. In Roman forts, the Principia was in a central location near the granaries and the commanding officer's residence. This Principia dates from the stone fort of Emperor Caracalla that we see today. It consisted of an open courtyard surrounded by several rooms which likely served as an armory for weapons and administrative offices. To receive wages or withdraw funds, the soldiers would reach through an opening over these decorated stone slabs. They once had iron grates on top. These curves on top of the stones are thought to have been slowly formed over time from soldiers reaching in to request payment. Also found in this courtyard were gaming pieces and evidence of gambling. We can imagine soldiers withdrawing more money for this purpose. This is a reconstruction of an ancient game board, but an actual game board was recently added and is now on display at the Mindelanda Museum. Here in the back of the Principia, we would have seen a statue of the emperor and the standards would have been stored here. Just behind this was a strong room, which stored the money for the garrison behind its extra thick walls. The money would have been placed in chests in this groove here, and it was guarded by soldiers 24 hours a day. A clock of some sort would have also existed in the Principia, and found outside the building was this remnant of a calendar, where we can still see the month of September. This rare object is a fragment of one of only three portable calendars from antiquity ever found. When complete, it would have been about one foot in diameter, and a peg would have to be manually moved to mark the day. It is not known if this was a simple, round calendar, or possibly part of a larger, more complex water clock. Near the barracks on the north side, a temple was built inside of the fort, probably in the early 3rd century. This is the only temple ever found in any Roman fort to date. It was dedicated to the god Jupiter Dolicanus, who was the god of weather as well as metalworking, and was popular in the early 3rd century. We can see a depiction here of Jupiter Dolicanus on top of a bull, with lightning bolts in one hand and an axe in the other. This is a replica of an altar, and the original is here in the Vindolanda Museum. Worship was associated with feasting, and there was also a heated dining room here in the temple where feasts could be held. There would have been a shrine with columns and a statue of the god here, which was likely similar to the depiction on the altar. This well-crafted copper hand was found, and may have been associated with the temple and held a small statue. Other decorative metal items found at Vindolanda include this griffin, which was possibly on top of a helmet, and a hound, which may have been used as the handle of a dagger. There were many changes to the fort in the early 4th century, when the fort itself would be transformed into a town. The town outside the fort had been abandoned around 280. Here we can see a house from the 4th century inside the fort walls near the western gate. The military garrison still remained, but at a reduced size. There seems to have been a period of relative peace in the first half of the 4th century. Some of the barracks here were converted to houses and shops. One of the granaries was converted to living accommodation as well as a shop, and due to coins found in the area, a market was believed to have been held on the streets here, just outside of the granary. These granaries were large and impressive buildings. The granaries of Roman forts were raised from the ground so that items could be easily offloaded from carts, and it also helps maintain the temperature of the building and keep out pests. 
the granaries were converted fully into some sort of living accommodation after the end of Roman rule, and artifacts were found here from the 5th to 8th centuries. Vindolanda continued to be occupied after the end of Roman Britain, which was considered to be around 410. The 5th and 6th centuries were the time of the possible historical figures that were the inspiration of King Arthur and Merlin. We know little about this time from Vindolanda, but one intriguing find was a tombstone of a man named Brigomalos, which dates from the 5th or 6th century. This name translates into something like Mighty Prince or High Chief. He may have been the head of some kind of a war band which was based at Vindolanda at the time, or possibly even a bandit leader, but we really aren't sure as this was a dark age for Britain. This stone plaque found dates from around 600 AD and has the Christian Kai Ro carved on one corner. One theory is that Vindolanda was converted to a monastic establishment around this time. In the Dark Age Kingdom of Northumbria, there are many of these sites which were sometimes created by nobles in order to get out of military service. Here we have the remains of a Christian church possibly dating to about 500 AD. This water tank was built near to two churches and it is theorized that it may have been used for baptisms at the time. More medieval artifacts are still being uncovered. Vindolanda is still a very active dig site with new buildings currently being excavated and new finds are recently on display in its museum including a recently excavated Christian chalice and a full cavalry sword. It remains to be seen what new artifacts will be uncovered and what else we can learn from this unique site. But for more information on recent excavations, you can check out the Vindolanda Trust. Hope you enjoyed this. If you have anything else to add, let me know in the comments. And thanks for watching.